Chris Guest is the president of the Vic Skeptics, um, and we have uh, the previous presence in the audience here too. <laughs> so welcome both. Uh, so yes, Bayesian philosopher, skeptic. Um, Chris Guest is a software developer with an academic background in philosophy, mathematics, and machine learning. He is interested in applying critical reasoning to boundary problems in skepticism and is involved in consumer complaints and skeptical advocacy. So, pleased to have you here. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, now, the neon equation up on the board here is uh, Bayes' theorem. Um, it, it could be a bit ominous for some, but I, I think we'll, we'll work through this. Uh, that particular sign is um, from a company called Autonomy, who specialised in applying Bayesian um, reasoning to certain accounting anomalies, who were then acquired by Hewlett-Packard, who discovered they'd purchased a fairly expensive accounting anomaly. Um, but uh, in, in a sense, what it represents is a way of improving uh, uh, probabilities based on extra evidence as it's gained. Now, uh, it's a kind of, uh, this is mathematics that dates back to the 18th century. It's, it's been very widely used in the last, you know, 50 or 60 years through a lot of science and medicine, um, all, all sorts of researchers. There's been things like, uh, it's been used a lot for textual analysis and uh, classification problems such as the authenticity of um, these um, American um, historical documents where there was issues of authorship. Um, it's used for things like image processing, such as face recognition, um, consumer analysis, and um, I suppose risk assessment as well. Um, so I'm talking about fairly established mathematics. I've called the talk Pitfalls of Bayesian Reasoning. I'm not trying to undermine the idea of Bayesian reasoning, but I'm, I'm perhaps going to work, work through some you know, rather strange examples. Uh, first off, I, I want to go through a, a fairly kind of pedestrian and acceptable example of, of how it all works. Uh, we'll talk about HIV testing. Um, now, the first, the preliminary HIV screening is called an ELISA test, and it, it's got a false positive rate of about 1 in 10,000, and a, I think a, uh, a false negative rate of about 1 in 1,000, which doesn't greatly impact on what we're talking about here. Uh, so if we've got a group of low-risk men, and there's 10,000 screen, there's probably going to be about one of those men with HIV and the rest without. Now, that, that means that we'll get one true positive result and then of the remainder, we'll get about one false positive result. Now, if we've got a population of high-risk men, we'll have about 150 of them with HIV out of 10,000. And so that'll be 150 true positive <coughs> results and one false positive result. So the question from this is, what are the chances of having HIV given that an ELISA test comes back positive? Now, looking at this information, it, um, our certainty of actually having HIV depends on which population we're in. Now, I'll just go through a bit of uh, notation here. Every time we, we see this uh, stroke, that vertical line, it means, um, it means given that. So, the probability of 
th this here says the probability of HRV positive status given that a, a test result is positive. So T plus means a positive test. Uh, the, so we, we can plug this into Bayes' theorem like this. And I'll, I'll explain the parts of this a bit later. So for the, for the low risk male, we're, we're, um, we're going to end up with less than a 50% chance that a, a, a positive test means they've actually got HIV. But with a, um, with a high risk male, it's going to be close to about 99% chance. Now, if we're told a test's accurate 9,999 times out of 10,000, it's counterintuitive to be told that a positive result is going to be wrong more than 50% of the time. Our, our minds aren't really geared for dealing with probability like this. And that there's plenty of situations where we can be quite easily misled. And, and in this sort of instance where we're talking, you know, HIV screening, there were quite a few instances in the 1980s and 1990s where, you know, there was a failure to communicate or, and um, carry out correct post-test counselling and, and it, it led to, you know, a lot of unintended results such as uh, suicides. And also the, the fact that, you know, you had people coming out of a uh, test situation with believing they were HIV positive who never went on to get HIV, it also fuels some of the um, HIV or AIDS denialism that we, we still have to deal with today. Uh, now, this is an example where we're talking about fairly known terms. It, it's all based on you know, our understanding of populations and, and so forth. It, it's easy enough to deal with the numbers and but Bayesian probability gets a bit, it, it gets a bit interesting when we start to deal with um, probabilities that are made without any kind of empirical observation. Now, I just want to go through, back to the original equation, I want, want to discuss some of the terms in it. We've got um, the original, we're talking about what the prior probability of A given that B. So the, the prior, prior probability is, is the original probability of A. Um, and then this, this term here is known as the likelihood. It, it's the converse probability of the one that we're trying to derive. And then the uh, probability of that evidence is known as the uh, normalising constant. And the, the final outcome, the probability that we derive from this is the uh, posterior probability. Uh, now, that there's one other fairly important thing I want to discuss. Uh, it, it's a fairly fundamental thing with probability, it's conditional independence. If we're looking at the probability of two different events, we can, of say, event A and event B, we can, we can um, multiply those two probabilities on the proviso that they are conditionally independent and that no, there's no causal relationship between those two events. So for example, um, if we were dealing with a deck of cards, the probability of the card being a heart and an ace is the probability of the card being a heart times the probability of the card being a, an ace. So it's, it's, it's one in 52. But if we're looking at the probability of the card being a number and the probability of being even, they're two things that are causally related. 
So we can't say that we, we can't multiply those probabilities out. Uh, this point, when I get to the strange examples, this, this point is fairly important. Okay, so I've, I've, I've given you some examples of uh, appropriate use of uh, Bayes' theorem. Now, I perhaps want to talk about some more egregious misuses of Bayesian reasoning. Um, now, it, it's perhaps a strange thing. I'm in a Unitarian church. I'm actually going to talk to you about Jesus today. Um, now, I'll, I'll give you two different Bayesian accounts of Jesus. There'll be the apologist Bayesian account and the uh, secularist Bayesian account. And okay, so under, under the uh, Bayesian resurrection, um, and Timothy and Lydia McGrew are both uh, American philosophers, and uh, they uh, put together an article called An Argument from Miracles. They, uh, cumulative case for the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, the gist of their argument, they, they try to, uh, I suppose, they're trying to rescue the argument from miracles um, from, the, from the jaws of David Hume. And they've, it, it, it's a serious piece of scholarship. It goes for about 60 pages. It's, it's all very well annotated. It, it uses you know, correct mathematical formalisms, and they've got an understanding of, you know, a wide spectrum of um, theological and, you know, biblical scholarship. It, it's, it's, not, it's not crank material. Um, now, in their argument, they're, they're dealing with the hypothesis of Jesus and Nazareth rose miraculously from the dead. And they bring up three different types of evidence. The uh, testimony of the women, such as you know, the empty tomb and the strange and miraculous visitors that they saw. The testimony of the uh, disciples. Um, they're a bit loose in their interpretation. I think they count about 13 disciples and associated witnesses who saw the resurrected Jesus who maintain their testimony on pain of martyrdom and so on. And thirdly, the uh, miraculous conversion of Paul, who, who witnesses Jesus on the road to Damascus and so forth. Um, so they, they've, um, they set out to find the probability of a resurrection, given this set of facts. And they, they do it in an odd interpretation. So they, they look at the um, probability of Jesus being resurrected, given those facts, and the probability of him um, not being resurrected, given that set of facts, and come up with some uh, bookies odds. And uh, so, so we could we can derive this from the original uh, Bayes equation that I put up earlier. And uh, so we, we've got all those terms, the probability of the resurrection and the probability of the resurrection given the um, testimony of the women, the disciples and um, St. Paul. And uh, they, they, they it's a 60-page uh, article that they've written. They spend a bit of time discussing, you know, the uh, various probabilities involved. They tend to think that the, uh, you know, that they're upfront and honest. They say resurrections don't happen every day, and they tend to think they're about 10 duodecillion to 1. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with this, OK? <laughs> And then they look at the probability of the of it comes to the testimony of the women. You know, given the chance, how, how should we judge that? Give, you know, what what's the 
the odds that the resurrection happened, given what the women say, as over the odds of it not happening, given what they say. And, and they kind of think, well, you know, there's, there's at least three of them there. You know, they've clearly witnessed something. It's got to be, you know, 100 to 1 for that, for it not to have happened if, if they said it did. And then it the, comes to the disciples and, you know, there's um, quite a few people that have seen it. You give each one about it. They're very honest men. You know, it's got to be sort of a thousand and one that they'd be fibbing about this stuff. Um, Chris, just on those from the Louis in particular, like PDRs. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's the probability from the that they were given that testimony, given the resurrection and how. Yeah, ex exactly. So this is the uh, this is the concept, the likelihood term. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And uh, of course, we're doing it as a ratio. We're not actually figuring out either of those actual probabilities. We're just figuring out the ratio between the two of them. Um, so, of course there were 13 disciples that are kind of set it at about 1,000 to 1 each. It, we, we get this rather gigantic term in there. And then when it comes to Paul, you know, he, he's a single, a single witness and he, we, we get a term thrown in of about 1,000 to 1. Um, so, they, they do the maths here and we end up finding out that the odds against Jesus not being resurrected are 10,000 to 1. So, now before we go to our bookmakers and discuss this further, I think we might see that there could be a few problems in this. Don't the uh, McGraws have set probability, likelihood terms, in possibly high values. You know, they, they suit their own agenda for, for starters. Not, I, don't, I don't think anyone else would, would be that inclined to take eyewitness accounts with such a level of certainty, with the, the same, perhaps, theological underpinnings. They, they were not that concerned about them being in the vicinity as such. They, um, it, it, it was, it's interesting because there's a group of two or three women, depending on which gospel, and they only rank as, you know, the odds for that rank is about 100 to 1. But for each of the individual disciples, that, you know, their testimony is worth 10 times as much. To a group of yeah yeah, and that that's um, <laughs> but that that's a judgment by today's theologians, so which is curious. Is it, and I thought that that would be one factor was that assessing the probability of the resurrection and how that was going to be assessed. Yeah. 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 Y
that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I agree with what that means. I just need to be set for my yeah. Anyway, so, um, you, can we, can we but let's not get off track here. Yeah. Um, the, the presentation has been sort of delayed for 10 minutes. So let's see how far we can get. What? And we've got a, a panel on this later. Okay. Well, we pro probably won't be talking biblical scholarship mm -hmm. later, but we've definitely got a panel on later. Um, so the, the, the interesting thing is here that they, they claim all the facts in their argument are conditionally independent, and they, the, the McGrews explicitly state this in their, their article. They say that each, you know, if, if there's one disciple that, you know, makes a statement, we, you know, that, that counts for a, a thousand to one kind of argument for, you know, taking it on board. But we, we multiply those terms out when we've got 13 of them. And they particularly use that argument about, you know, them seeing what happened to all the other disciples as a, an argument to promote mute, the conditional independence of those terms. What they completely ignore are the possibilities that uh, they've, there's been some kind of either confabulation of, of the witnesses or that there's been some kind of, um, you know, hallucination or that the whole thing is fiction and that these are fictional characters we're dealing with. Those, those things just don't feature in this, um, in this account. Okay, so that, that, that's, the, uh, that's the Bayesian resurrection. Uh, now, now, you know, theological people are superstitious and they, they use probability in very strange and convoluted ways and, you know, the rest of us, are, we're all very secular here and none of us are guilty of that kind of thing, you know. People that are secular are just totally above board, right. Uh, okay, now the, the other end of the spectrum um, I want to talk about is uh, Richard Carrier. Now he's a um, he's fairly prominent humanist, he's, he's a classical scholar and he, his, his axe to grind, I suppose, is he he doubts that there was a historical person called Jesus. Um, so he's, he's part of this, he's part of this um, movement of, who are known as the uh, mythicists. And he, he's, uh, he put out a book called Proving History, Bayes Theorem and the Quest for the Historical Jesus. Now, uh, this book looks at, it, it doesn't really go into a lot of the details about the uh, historicity of Jesus, but he, he puts together a, the groundwork of, of a historical methodology to, to approach it. Um, and it, th this is a, a reductionist account of, of history, as uh, he, he pretty much says, you know, let's look at the methods that historians can employ. Um, if they're valid methods, they'll conform to, you know, Bayesian analysis. If, if they don't conform to Bayesian analysis, we, we really should abandon them. So he, he's not talking about, you know, this is a way of explaining what historians do. He's saying this is what historians should be doing. Uh, that was his first book on the topic. Um, he, he's recently put out a, a second book on the historicity of Jesus, why we might have reasons for doubt. And that, that is a 700-page um, Bayesian argument uh, that against the uh, existence of Jesus, if, if anyone's interested in reading it. Uh, now, prior to that, he also used a Bayesian argument concerning um, the question of authenticity in the writings of Tac Tacitus about Jesus. And I'll, I'll just go through this example today because it, it's perhaps a more manageable example and uh, you, you, I think you'll be happier <laughs> that, I, that I leave it at this. Um, so Tacitus was a Roman historian. Um, he was perhaps 
I think he was the first Roman historian to explicitly mention Jesus in some form. He, there's a passage in his work, The Annals, uh, 1544, um, that connects Christ, Pontius Pilate, and the persecution of Christians by Nero. So if, if you're someone who comes from this mythicist point of view and you, you want to deny the existence of Jesus, this would be the sort of passage that would be of strategic importance if, in um, demonstrating that it was a later interpolation or forgery. Um, now, the, the passage, I'll, I'll briefly quote the passage. It says, uh, Nero, it, it, it's about the events that happened after the Great Fire of Rome, and it, it says that Nero fostered the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. And a most mischievous superstition thus uh, checked for the moment again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their centre and become popular. Okay, so we, we've, you know, th that, that's the passage that uh, Richard Carey is scrutinising. And he, he, he's uh, written this article in a, um, he, he's published this article in a, um, in a book on, Bibli in a journal of biblical scholarship, the Vigili Christiani. Um, the original article as published there didn't include the Bayesian content because the, uh, I guess the, the uh, journal's editors didn't quite see it relevant, but he, he's since published it in a, a later collection of his articles, if you want to chase it up. Now, I've, I, for consistency, I'll try to use the same kind of notation that I use for the McGrew article. I've played with the terms a little bit just to make it consistent, but it, it's pretty much the same argument as it appears in Richard Carrier's piece. So I, I just quoted this passage, the Testimonium uh, Tacitus, and the uh, chances, the, the first term we'll deal with here is PTT, the chances of it being authentic, as opposed to the chances of, of it not being authentic. And uh, again, like the McGrews, uh, Carrier sets out a, a, a set of facts. Um, the first one is this passage has no influence on stories of Nero's persecutions of Christians. Um, so there's, it doesn't have any impact on martyrdom stories from the first century. The second fact is that no Christian, there's no Christian men men mention of this passage until the fourth century. Thirdly, there's no knowledge of this passage by any Latin or Greek author until the fourth century. And lastly, the uh, testimonium tastum fits the Christian cult better than Christians. So, again, we, we, we start off, um, Carrier defines the odds of uh, any arbitrary passage in Tacitus being a later interpolation or forgery as being about 200 to 1. And then he look, looks at the chances of... Um, of that passage being uh, of the, uh, you know, those various datums being um, true or false, given given the um, the authenticity or inauthenticity of the passage. So, so this follows the same kind of argument structure that um, the McGrews use, and so it. He, he combines them in this term like 
this, and we end up learning that uh, the odds against the testimonium, Tacitum being authentic, are about a bit over three to one. So there's a 75% chance of it being a forgery. Now, the, the problem again with all of this is this, um, this term here. There's this assumption that all these um, facts are mutually independent. But, you know, if we, we look at that list of facts that he was talking about, there's no mention of this passage till the fourth century AD in Christian literature. There's no mention of it in Greek or Latin literature. Surely there could be some mutually, some conditionally related circumstance that, that caused those things to happen. Um, we can't really assume that all these four terms are mutually independent. So the um, logic of his argument breaks down. Now, you know, I've, I've talked about the specific problems with these particular um, Bayesian arguments, but uh, I perhaps want to talk a bit more generally about Carrier's idea of, of using, uh, you know, Bayesian reasoning as a as a uh, the uh, best practice in historical methodology. I I I, th I think the general appeal here in you know, I suppose your historical methodology is, is the same as it in, is for a scientific methodology. Uh, we're dealing with, you know, the, the underlying problem that we're dealing with is the um, issue of inductive I inference. We're, we're going from a lot of facts and we're trying to construct theories and, you know, is it rational to um, to use um, inferential reasoning under those circumstances? Now, the, the Bayesian approach is one way out because we can we, we, we're saying it's not actually rational to generalise from specifics to the general case, but it can improve our probabilities and our you know let us approach certainty if, if we see a repetition of things a number of times. So in that, in that way, it, the, there's, um, it's not such a bad uh, philosophical approach to take. Um, I'd, I'd also mention a, a paper by uh, Paul, the uh, philosopher of science, Paul Thagard, who uh, it was, um, it's called the uh, causal inference in legal decision making. And he compares two approaches to uh, machine learning, ex um, explanatory coherence versus uh, Bayesian networking, networks. And he works through the, you know, the kind of examples we've seen to date have been fairly kind of armchair examples of um, Bayesian problems. He, wo he works through the argument that was outlined in the uh, Klaus von Bühler murder trial, which was a fairly famous celebrity murder trial from about 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and he develops a fairly complicated set of facts, and it, it involves about 96 probability nodes in his um, Bayesian network model. So this, this is a lot more complicated than the simple equations we were looking at earlier. And he compares that to another um, machine learning approach called explanatory coherence. What, what's the interesting outcome of this that reflects what we were seeing earlier, perhaps, is that he says that the problem with taking the, the Bayesian approach is you have to assign a probability to all of these nodes. And it, it's a fairly arbitrary thing. Whereas, you know, just looking at the, the explanatory coherence approach, um, with, you know, it, it tended to look at more of the overall structure of the arguments used, and um, it, it didn't really rely on any 
uh, perhaps circular reasoning that involved you know, putting the probabilities in that you'd like to see. Um, now, the other thing I found curious with Carrier's account is that amidst the role of uh, you know, Bayesian methods in uh, statistical text analysis, I mentioned, mentioned earlier the Federalist Papers. There's been a lot of research with, uh, you know, using Bayesian um, methods and, you know, quite a, a variety of um, machine learning algorithms to uh, determine text classifications, authorship, authenticity, you know. Even away from academic things, you, you look at software like spam filters, it, it, it's using these kinds of approaches. But, uh, you know, there's, there's been 800 years of um, biblical concordance research, the frequency and occurrence of words in texts like the Bible. A lot of, there are researchers who are seriously interested in this stuff, and for the last 50 or 60 years, there's been some very serious, you know, uses of um, these approaches. Um, the Federalist Papers was one case. The um, Frederick Nestella and David Wallace analysed a hundred of these um, documents. Some of the authorship was well attested. Some was quite unknown. They, they. They checked for the frequency of certain, you know, word phrases and um, and the absence of others, and they they came up with a fairly solid um, argument as to who the actual authors of those those articles was. And you know, this is happening computationally in the days of um, punch card tape and so forth. Um, so it, it's not just Bayesian approaches where this kind of thing happens in machine learning. There's all sorts of term frequency analysis. There's uh, genomic algorithms, as well as Bayesian approaches. And it's certainly, you know, researchers these days are perhaps going a bit beyond um, Bayesian analysis. You, you hear a lot about support vector machines and other, you know, cutting edge, edge approaches. Um, the other thing I wanted to come back to, I, the first example I showed was one where the, the probabilities were based on some quantitative understanding of the incidence of HIV and the number of false and negative um, tests. And um, whereas the second case, the probabilities were based more on the, the author's opinions of how likely things might be. So I suppose there's a you frequently hear about the distinction between objective Bayesianism versus uh, subjective Bayesianism. Um, so, I think in the historical case, I, th I think you know perhaps doing some kind of analysis of text met metrics as opposed to doing um, you know opting for self-assessed um, certainties. Might, might give more interesting and uh, less circular results. Okay. Okay, so do we have questions? In the um, Timothy and Lydia, I think, group or article. Yeah. Um, well, my tongue was in my cheek, but I'm not honestly sure that theirs was. Sure. Uh, but it, 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 it's well worth a read. It's, there's good scholarship in there, and yeah. you will learn a, a, a bit about some serious historians if you read it. No, I'd like to read it. I mean, the one-way thread on my better women was the probability 
Love is taken and goes to the left. Yeah. Now the probability of them getting it wrong should be utterly divorced from whether it comes from a, a low risk or high risk. The lab doesn't know whether this is a high risk or low risk group. No, but it, it's the ratio. If you're in a low risk group, you've got a very low background chance of having HIV. So for every, the chances are for every one false positive, there will be one true positive in that group. So your background incidence is very low. But when you're in a high risk group, that it's an odd consequence, but the test tends to be more accurate because there's a lot more people, you've got a much better background chance of having HIV. There's still the same one in 10,000 mistake, but there's also 150 people with HIV in that group. Whereas in the first group, there's only one person with HIV. So in fact, in the second case where that happens, test is right because it's wrong, if you know what I mean. If the test is giving a false reading and says this is positive, because it's a higher risk group, that false positive is in fact a genuine positive because it's a higher risk group. You know, you know what I mean? I, I see what you mean. Because the laboratory doesn't know whether there are, it's, it's just a false reading. Well, it's it the laboratory test. doesn't even, it's a preliminary test, the laboratory won't even know that it's yeah. false. There are only, we only talk about it being a false positive because there's a subsequent testing process. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, uh, but I think that's, the, that's why you get such a conclusion, is because the test comes back with a false positive. But in fact, because of the person coming from a high risk group, they are in fact positive. You know what I mean? Let, let, yeah. It's actually not germane to what you've been talking about, but I'm just fascinated from yeah. medical leave. The, the false positive, let's say, happened because of fact, fact yeah. and Yeah. The, there's also a very slight chance of a uh, false negative in there as well, but mm -hmm. you, it, it's about one in 1,000, so. It, usually doesn't happen in that kind of population size. Yep. Uh, if objective data is available in the surrounding something, yep. is it ever um, rationally justifiable to attempt a subjective patient approach? Oh. Or should we try to never do by this process with subjective probabilities? There's, there's plenty of cases there's a good argument to say that, you know, we should start off with what our, we provisionally think and change it based on subsequent evidence. I suppose the cases I've talked about today were slightly absurd because the people that were deciding what those probabilities were were fairly partisan in their beliefs in the first instance. Um, but there's plenty of instances. I know a lot of techniques with, you know, some of those things like uh, customer behaviour predictions and so forth. A lot of the guesses involved. You might start off with a, you know, a completely vague guess, and you you just refine it over time with a number of iterations. So, it it's certainly a, it certainly is a starting point that in practice gets used a lot of the time. I suppose the, the problem is when you're not going through any process of refinement, when you've, you've got these very closed world examples where you, you know, you, your final results are based on what your, um, your initial assessments are, that's where the issue is. Yep. Um, the, you basically give you a sense, the base is really only useful when there are independent um, measures on that. Uh, conditionally independent, are there statistical tests to determine whether the data you've got actually suffers from dependence? So you can actually use it to help filter whether or not the test is usable in the database. It's a good question. I'm not 
I'm not particularly sure of a general case. The, the converse, there are actual, there's something called, uh, there's a technique in machine learning called naive base that just says, oh, let's forget about the whole independent. Let's just assume it's independent. We know it's not, but it makes the maths a lot easier. And for some kinds of problems, some text analysis and stuff, you'll get reasonable results by just throwing that independence criteria out the window and going on regardless. Um, but there's, there's probably a variety of tests and approaches depending on the domain. Do you suspect that they are independent events? Yeah, quite, yeah, quite possibly. Or I suppose in the, the last example I gave with the Bayesian hierarchy, that, that was a different approach that, that used a, a, a tree structure of modelling of facts that would lend itself to more causally dependent terms. You didn't have to talk about the learning aspects of the yeah. Bayes either, where given your evidence, it can change your approach. Yeah. Um, does that influence the results? Uh, yeah, yeah. Does it influence the. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I think um, if you have a hypothesis, like let's say your hypothesis was that um, there was four accounts of um, Jesus, but you also had the hypothesis that Jesus didn't exist, yeah. then what you do, if your hypothesis, you use that as a um, as the lower number, and all the ones that you're not sure of, you use them as bigger numbers. So if you're not sure whether someone was right or not, you wouldn't give them a percentage of like 1 in 10, you'd give it like a 9 out of 10, you'd give it the, the compliment to what you call it. Yeah. So you wouldn't be using, on things you didn't know or didn't be part of your hypothesis, you wouldn't be using small numbers because they can change the figures too much. Yeah, I get you. Particularly, yeah, if you multiply them out, yeah, that's where it can come from. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot.